this is a big story, not a small story. Women get impacted. They do a lot of work to protect, preserve the earth, shift to regenerative agriculture, shift mm. to renewable energy. They're getting no support, no funding, and no voice at the table. Let's shift that. My guest today is Zainab Salbi, an Iraqi-American woman who has dedicated her life to supporting women surviving conflict and war everywhere from Sarajevo to Rwanda, from Iraq to Afghanistan, and so many other countries. She founded the organization Women for Women International at the age of 23, and it's an organization that has been heralded the world over for 30 years. I first learned about Zainab when I read her memoir about growing up with her family living under the shadow of Saddam Hussein as her father was directed to be Saddam's personal pilot. Her story, that book, was riveting, and I still think about it 15 years after having read it. She's written three more books since then. The latest one is titled Freedom is an Inside Job, and it's another incredibly riveting read and it reveals the power that we each have to heal ourselves and the world when we examine our own shadows and align with our own core values. Zainab has been a guest on Oprah Winfrey, I think she said 10 times, which apparently is not a record, but she's also a journalist who's had her own talk show broadcast in 22 Arab and Middle Eastern countries. She has many more ventures we're going to talk about in the show, but her latest of which is Daughters for Earth, and it may be her most world-changing effort to date. I hope you'll enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Hello, Zainab. Salvi, how are you? Oh, great. Thank you so much. How are you? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. It, it's been an interesting day so far, so I think it's going to get more interesting talking with you. So, <laughs> um, I just want to welcome you, first of all, to How We Change the World. Uh, I, I told you I was a little starstruck. I, I really feel deeply honored to have you here, and I don't, I don't think I've ever said that to anyone before. <laughs> but um, That touches yeah. me deeply. Thank you. The honor is truly mine with any... You know, with you, with with women who are committed to changing the world and making the world a better place. So it's always mine. Thank you. Well, thank you. And it is uh it's amazing how many women are. The more the more we go I go digging, the more I go looking, I'm just I'm thoroughly excited by what I see women doing in the world more and more every day. So including your newest project, which we'll get to. Um so yeah, I'll just um, explain a little bit that I came, I found you first in about 2006, maybe a little more, um, when I first read your book, uh, Between Two Worlds, Escape from Tyranny, and of course, about the life of you growing up in Iraq and um, living in Iraq Iran through the Iraq-Iran War, and then of course, your father working for Saddam Hussein and all that brought to your family and your life and the consequences. So um, I, I exaggerate not one bit when I say, I think it's the most impactful book I've read. I have never stopped telling anyone about it. I don't know exactly even what it was, um, but there was, I think just the real life experiences that occurred in for you were just on their own, but then your storytelling on top of it just made it very palpable. So, um, so we, we're going to get into that a little bit. Um, and I just finished your last book too. So we'll, we'll talk about all of that. Right. Um, but um, first I, I kind of just wanted to start with a big picture of your life so that listeners and uh, viewers really understand um, the impact that you've been making, you know, starting at the age of 23. So um so I think what we'll do is I'm just going to kind of name the big elements of your life and then we'll, we'll dig into them a little bit more. So at 23, you founded Women for Women International and that the age speaks to a lot. It's just in that, you know, just 23 year old, you were newly married. And, um, you know, I, I want to hear more about the details of exactly how that happened, because even reading everything, I'm still feel like I'm missing some parts that I'm curious about, but that uh, and you were helping women who were survivors and victims of war, starting with the Bosnian War, and um, 
uh, it became so hugely impactful, though. I don't know if when you started at 23, where you thought that was going. Not really. <laughs> you just wanted to go help. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it, it ended up after 30 years and over the course of time, it, you, you won the largest humanitarian prize ever, the Hilton um, Humanitarian Award, which was just the first women's organization to receive that. But I mean, honestly, you've been on Oprah six times. I think that must be a record. I don't know. Maybe it's more than that by now. Ten times. Oh, ten. <laughs> is that a record? No, no. Oh. I'm sure there are people who are more, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, that, that, and then I know she was the guest because then you went on to have your own um your own show in which was broadcast a 20 your talk show broadcast to 26 22 countries in the middle east uh highlighting the lives of arab and muslim women which i was also thrilled about because that i wish we had it in the united states i don't think it was on here was it that's mm -hmm. we, yeah. this is where we need <laughs> we need that um you know and you've won you were recognized by for the White House, I mean, the, the awards are too long to go through. We'll take up the whole story, um, the, the time that we have. But it, it, you've just done some remarkable things. You've written four books, three, three of which I've read. Um, and you've been a journalist. I, I just see all the other things that I don't want. I'm not going to take time for now. But I do want to mention the last thing and the current project. So can you just speak... Uh, sort of over the overview of that, and then we'll back up and kind of fill everything in. I want to leave plenty of time for that at the end because it's so significant and it's, and it's right now. Um, Daughters for Earth is a, it's a new uh, project, relatively new, that I co-founded with uh, Jody Allen, which aims at uh, three things. Um, mobilizing as many resources, as much resources, particularly to women-led climate solutions. Uh, women are absent, as you probably notice, from uh, the discussion that we hear on the news media, uh, media about climate. It's not because they're not doing anything. It is, for my, in my opinion, the same story that we face with women all the time. We do the bulk of the work, we get impacted, we don't get money and we don't get mentioned and we are not invited at the negotiating table. And the same thing goes with the climate. Women are impacted uh, severely by climate change. They're doing a lot of work in terms of uh, human-led solutions that are tangible and uh, scientifically based and they're not being acknowledged and they're getting two cents out of every dollar that is going to environmental issues. That number and is so... Just you know, at the birth of this came, frankly speaking, for a variety of reasons. One is to address this issue that mm -hmm. we need to put more money in the hands of women who are working on climate solutions. Um, and then the second one is to raise awareness that women are leading the issue and we've got to invite them at the negotiating table. And there was also a very personal issue for me, which um, came out of my own illness, Um well, I couldn't live in the city anymore and I could only live in the countryside and, really? and I was barely able to breathe and to walk. And in that time, I felt um, earth was my healer. I really, I felt like the trees were my cheerleaders and, mm -hmm. you know, and beside the food that I was eating, I felt like, you know, everything around earth were like cheering for me to stay mm -hmm. alive continue to breathe and to walk and Goodness. I came out of this experience saying this is just not I owe it to mother earth to do everything in my hands everything possible to pay it back to thank it to love it wow. um and it's not you know and and the birthing of that or the expression of that came through daughters for earth um you know but really, it's also a very personal commitment um, that we are, we've got to do all we can for this mm -hmm. beautiful Mother Earth of ours. And mine happened to be when I was sick, but I think we all, we don't need to be sick to, rem to remember mm. why it's keeping us alive. Wow. Well, it seems like everything that you do comes from a very personal experience, a very personal um, awareness that comes to you. So, um, yes, I want to hear much more about that. So now where do you live? You live in the country more? Or I live in the, exclusively in the countryside, as a matter of fact, you know, yeah. And you were um, in the city always. 
I all my life I was uh, mm-hmm. you know I'm I, you know I'm born and raised in a city in Baghdad yeah. Iraq but all my life I lived in the city and now I'm exclusively in the countryside and it helps me stay alive and stay optimistic and really connected reconnected uh, myself to joy uh, mm. and, uh, because of the nature I believe I I really believe it's because oh, of nature that's so yeah. interesting yeah wow. Well, let's take a look back then and take a little journey through your very remarkable life. Um, and I hope, are you are you happy to talk about the different segments, any place sure. you don't want to take us? I, I know that after so many years, you've had to repeat your story so many times, but it's so, uh, there's still a lot of people who haven't heard it. And, uh, and I think, especially when we look at Daughters of Earth and how all these different events of your life are reflective of your the song, if you will, of helping women. And that when you drew that analogy on, it's on the, there's a video at the beginning of, on the Daughters of Earth website that talks about um, what is happening to Mother Earth as though it's happening in the same wording that you might use for what's happened to women at war, the abuse and the, um, the pressure and the disregard and the disrespect and it's happening to mother earth. So I, I just, it's such a full circle life and consistent life that you've led. So can you just start a little bit with your, with your home in Iraq? Uh, you know, I don't uh, know exactly what starting point you want to begin if it's with your, when you're 11 or, or prior to that, but <laughs> you're living at a beautiful home. And- <laughs> beautiful so home. Uh, just a slight co- correction is daughters for earth. Oh, I, um, I said of, yes. Uh, uh, and though I wish we have the name daughters of earth because I love that name, but it's a, it's a writer's uh, group, I believe actually who has it. So uh, having said that I grew up in Baghdad, Iraq um, to, I would say a happy family. And we had a, an upper middle class family, um, um, I would say for me, it was very normal for a lot of Americans, probably that's different than the stereotype people here of Baghdad, Iraq. I actually grew up um, with a very modern family. Um, mm. I don't know what to say, lots of parties, like, whatever. Like when I describe my life, uh, having lived now at this point of my life more in America than in Iraq, I mm-hmm. left Iraq when I was 19, almost 20. Um you know, for me, it's uh, the, you know, this transition of culture in terms of speed. America is very fast in terms of, uh, you know, language, of course. But in terms of, you know, my able, my ability to access um, a very modern lifestyle, there was yeah. not much difference at all, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Uh, um, as, a, as it is now in America. You're saying? As it, yes, yes. Or you then, know, like, yeah. you know, if anything, probably I had a better lifestyle in Iraq, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. economically speaking, at least, you know, mm-hmm. um, uh, than in America. But, you know, but that was, um, anyway, that's how I grew up in. And, and life ha- did change, as you mentioned, at the age of um, uh, around 11 for a variety of reasons. Um, and I would mention the three most important one. One is that, imp- that end up impacting my life forever. And one is... Um, there was a declaration of war between Iran and Iraq. Um, and a new reality came to my understanding as a child. How um, old were you then? I was in the 80s then, right? So I was 11. Uh, I was oh, when 11 the war started? Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, that impacted my life because, you know, as a young age, I was like seeing all the news talking about, you know, the war, the front lines, which is led by men. But no one was talking about the back line, which how I was experiencing that war, you know, which was all led by women, mm-hmm. uh, the school teachers, my mother, the factory workers, the, uh, you know, the police woman, the doctor, everyone was a woman and keeping life going. And obviously no one mm-hmm. was talking about them. They were only talking about men fighting. We still do that. We Look still at Ukraine. That. You don't hear the stories of the women who are- up. You know, still men fighting with each other. Da, 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 ah, da, da. You know, it's like, you know, seriously, I look, I hear the news and I just like roll my eyes up. It's yeah. like nothing has changed. And I'm not talking about Russia or Ukraine, whatever, but the attitude and the the perspective of how they embark upon, upon life and war and uh, is the same. Not, it hasn't changed. And I feel Amazing. like yeah. how many wars, how many millions of people we kill, how much damage more we do to the to Earth before we understand 
wars, in my opinion, never work, rarely works. Um, anyway, so that was an impact on my, uh, that impacted my later work to launch Women for Women International. Um, the second impact is Saddam Hussein, as you referred to earlier. Um, I realized he was a friend of my parents, and I had no idea before. And um, Was this before it, he was uh, president? Uh, he after. was a vice president when he was a friend, mm -hmm. and the friendship was declared formally in a surprise visit to our house when he was a president. And I was like, what? My parents know the guy who is the picture is in my classroom, basically, you know, and that he knew me. And I was, you know, anyway, mm -hmm. that relationship was a very hard relationship um, that uh, definitely impacted me a lot, impacted my relationship with fear and my understanding of it, impacted my commitment to women and impacted um, my appreciation, deep appreciation to freedom deep appreciation for freedom. Um, and because we were his social friends and he made my father his pilot and they had a Iraqi air, uh, not airlines, uh, aviation. Um, oh, head and, of aviation, uh, yeah. And it's, uh, we were feared, you know, the people feared us because mm. we were friends of Saddam Hussein and we feared Saddam Hussein because we were not his relatives or family members. And we feared the people because they feared us because, <laughs> and so there was fear everywhere. I grew up in a house that was bugged, uh, cars that were bugged, everything in my life was listened to and monitored and um, it was suffocating. It was really suffocating. And the Can last just, thing... Oh, sure. Well, just a Go question ahead. on that. So did he... Uh, I'm just trying to understand, did it... The friendship with your parents, but they were friends when he was vice president, and then he became president slash dictator, uh, and, the, and the friendship continued. Was that a willing friendship on their part, or did they know... Oh, no. They, my parents were not political they were people. Liberal, yeah. Uh, not even, it has nothing to do with liberal. They're not political people. And mm. uh, he was actually liberal, socially liberal at the beginning, at least. It was mm. not uh, nothing to do with that. Hmm. They were just not political and they had nothing to do with politics. And my mom is dead, but my father is alive and he still doesn't want to mm. do anything with politics. Uh, he, they were chosen because of that, uh, because oh. they come from a social elite that they spoke English and knew how to dance to Western music and travel the world. And their purpose was to introduce mm. him to another aspects of the world that he was not familiar with. He did not speak English. He was not familiar with um, oh. Western music or eating mm. with uh, in Western etiquette right. or any of that. That was their purpose. And because they didn't have political ambitions, or it, they were best, you know, they were safe, basically. They're not mm. a threat to him. They, they had no idea what not, they were getting into. Uh, well, they yeah, did um, not want that right. relationship. They resisted, resisted for many years. And at mm. one point they were cornered into a decision where uh, particularly they visited a friend uh, at night after an outing in the club. And they just, you know, dropped at a friend as things were in the 70s mm -hmm. and uh, and the friend opened the door and he said Saddam Hussein's in the living room and they always talk about that moment which is to enter uh, the living room is to initiate the friendship and oh, they would, they've been in a uh, resisting for two years mm -hmm. and to leave would be to be rude to him and um, you know it's to root I mean that's what they were thinking is to be rude yeah and of course, dangerous, but rude. Right. And so they both talk about this most mm, significant moment in their mm. history because they entered the room and they were, the trapped. Rest, uh, they were trapped and the rest was history. Now, I criticized them for the longest time until I was once in a, caught in a cocktail reception with um, some of the strategists behind uh, the first Gulf War, which I, and the second, sorry, the second Gulf War, um, which I was vehemently against, not uh, not out of love for Saddam, but out of understanding that this is not how you change the world. Right. So I, and I, you're I, talking about American strategists. That American strategists, uh, okay. yeah, it, it was at that time part of the neocon uh, quarters. And where was I was in a reception and, you know, and one of them came and said and spread his arms to shake mine. And, 
you know, I always criticize my parents for shake, you know, for entering the room. Right. Why did you enter? Right. But you know what? In that moment, I did the same thing. I shook yeah. his hand. I was like, oh, I did the polite thing rather yeah. than saying you're just destroying my country, you know? So yeah. Yeah. it took me a long time. It took me actually until my 30s, which was uh, uh, rather, for, uh, you know, to, to really understand it's much easier to judge people than it is to actually be in yeah. their position. And then the last thing um, mm -hmm. that really impacted my life is, is my mother, who despite the war and despite the, this horrible relationship we had with Saddam, um, was a strong feminist who taught me all about women's rights, made me read women's rights books, and told me stories. And when I was 16, I turned to her and I said, Mama, when I grow older, I want to help all women around the world. Oh, at 16, um, and you that. At 16, yeah. and she turned to me and she was driving at that time and she said, honey, you can do it. And that was um, another wow. important moment in my life that really shaped the rest of my um, belief that I can. Well, those are three very powerful uh, segments that have formed your life or, or powerful events. Um, but then, but then at what point did you, now I have to admit, it's been a little while since I've read that, your first book. So, um, at what point did you, did things change when she sent you away, I suppose, right? Well, um, so this is a very progressive mother and a family generally, mm -hmm. and told me that I, um, I'm to choose everything in my life, um, mm -hmm. particularly yeah. my love and who I marry and mm -hmm. all of that. And. At age 19, she, after a failed relationship I had with a guy that I thought that he would help me escape from that surrounding of Saddam and his family, um, she uh, came to me and she said, there's a marriage proposal for you from America and please accept. And I was really, you know, it's, um, you know, you know, traditionally speaking, it would be this would be called an arranged marriage. Uh, some friends from the region they would say that's convenience marriage. Mm -hmm. um, I was really not aware of any of that. I was just my mom was crying hysterically, begging me to accept. I had already been a bad girl by trying to have a relationship with a guy who was horrible mm -hmm. and I wanted to be a good daughter mm -hmm. and uh, it was not forced on me. Um, my father was against it, but I against you marrying him. I'm, I'm marrying a yeah. stranger, basically. Yeah. You know, so what he was in America, it was a stranger, yeah. and and my mom was very adamant that she needed me to get out, and I end up listening to my mother and 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 begging her not to cry. I like that's mm -hmm. all what I wanted yeah. to, uh, for my mother not to cry, and and that's how I came to America. Um, only to find that guy. Um, I married him within two weeks of arriving here and Iran, Iraq, uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait rather uh, within a month of my arrival here. And I found myself um, with this guy who ended up being a horrible man mm -hmm. who ended up um, abusing me, sexually abusing me yeah. uh, while my family in Iraq and I end up escaping from him three months after the marriage for his abuse because I knew that I am not to tolerate any abuse, even if it's from my husband, not even, it doesn't matter from whom my mother from told anyone, me never to tolerate um, and, um, and I left and um, I left with $400 in my pocket two suitcases of nice clothes and that's how I started my life here in America formally at the age of 20. Do you think before moving forward, do you think there was something like you said, you wanted to be a good girl for your mom. She wouldn't stop crying. You wanted to, do you think there was some just in, uh, instinct that told you you better get out of Iraq, that there was something guiding you there? Or do you think it was as simple as wanting to do what your mom wanted for you? Even though it went against my, everything she had ever taught yeah. you. <laughs> no, my mother was adamant that I need to get out of Iraq. It was clear. She feared for me from mm -hmm. Saddam Hussein. I did not know that. I had no idea until nine years later on her deathbed. And I, if anything, I felt very betrayed and very angry at my mom during the nine years that I was in America and she was in Iraq. Because and, she sent you uh, away. 
because I felt she betrayed me by putting me in this arranged mm. marriage to this horrible man. Yes. Yes. And I, it really, it really impacted our relationship. And yeah. it took me, it took her deathbed. Uh, she, she died from Lou Gehrig's disease. And um, there was, you know, it's hard to talk about death in a beautiful way. It was obviously a very painful time, um, but it was a time in which we knew she was also dying. And so we would um, tell truth to each other. Yeah. Literally every night we would tell oh. truth to each other. And, oh, that's uh, beautiful. And yeah. so she told me all her truth and I told her all my truth. And and I was able to, you know, understand, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a, you know, she, it was, uh, that's why I say it's, it was a beautiful way to die because we were able to um, heal. Uh, whatever that was broken and wow. and and understand why Thank she God. tried to do what she did and told me her whole story of what happened which i do document in in my memoir um mm. so that's uh, so that's why but I, for the longest time i had no idea i was just angry at her but just to be clear um because you kind of skipped over to i mean didn't fully go into the point that she actually thought he was looking at you uh, that Saddam Hussein was starting to desire you and looking at you as, and just, I mean, one of the scenes that I remember from the book wasn't so much about him as it was his sons. And I remember you talking about, I've blocked out their names. I think Udi and I, I it's been so many years right. since I've thought yeah. about their names, uh-huh. but they, I remember this one scene where you talk about where they would go into like a school dance, lock out, like lock all the doors and the sons would just go and pick out all the women that they wanted and take them with them. And something about the way you describe that scene, you are a fantastic storyteller. This is such an innate gift that you have that comes through everything, including it's going to be Daughters for Earth, your your role, I'm sure, because it's so important to help people relate. Without the story, there's no, it doesn't matter if it happened. There's no, there's no lessons to be learned or so there's something about the way you describe that that has sort of haunted me ever since. So when when I read, I think just in your most recent book, um, Freedom is an Inside Job, that, that that's what happened, that your mother revealed to you that uh, she was trying to save you from Saddam personally. And I was like, oh, my God, that, that was probably worth it. I, I guess you came to assume that it probably was worth it in the long run as well. Uh, I came to appreciate, I came, I don't know if it's worth it. Listen, I don't know, right? I'm grateful for my life, right? I'm grateful for my entire life. um, And I would not change anything in it. But I, what I learned from it is I came to appreciate you know, the, the different layers of what people have. I feel like we humans are like, um, you know, oceans or seas. We only experience each other from the surface, you know, mm-hmm. um, but there is a whole depth to each water. You know, you go inside and there's a whole life and animals and, you know, everything, Another you know, and a whole, a whole world. We are yeah. so like, whoa. And I feel yeah. like, you know, we judge each other only from seeing the surface. We That's what we, you know, we only see the surface. And so it taught me that it's, it's not what I would, you know, it's not, you know, it taught me that I saw it this way. She had these other reasons. And now as an adult woman, frankly, I see the same story of how Saddam or, or his sons and whatever looked or said or treated and if I have a daughter, I too would do everything to get her out, yeah, right? Yeah. But it took me to be an adult yeah. uh, to realize, oh, I understand what she has. She had to do what she had to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like I'm still discovering in my life, like more and more, the older I get, the decisions my mother and, and my father made and the the reasons why they did it. And I try to look at my own involvement of my own life. And, you know, you just, you just want more and more depth for some reason, the older you get, the more it becomes on your mind. I don't know why, but um, we really do come to understand them better and, and life better, obviously. Yeah. So, so then, so you moved to Washington and um, what were you doing there just to go to school? I mean, how did you even know where to go when you left this 
scary man you're married to. <laughs> Whose name we shall not use. <laughs> no, I changed his name in the book uh, for uh, other reason. But uh, my my uh, nickname, uh, the way I named him and the way I read it in the book is uh, Shit Trap, basically. You know, so that's the only name I would use for him. That's uh, <laughs> uh, That was my small revenge. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I um, I call some. Uh, relatives, uh, extended relatives, mm. and distant friends of my parents, and oh, they all good. came and they showed up and they oh. really helped me. And oh, um, good. I'm so okay. grateful for them. I'm just full of yeah. gratitude for them. They they really helped me yeah. create my new life. Um, and eventually, I was able to get a working permit to work here, and I went to Washington D.C. to work. Um, I was I already left college in Iraq. I was fourth year in college, so I never finished my college in Iraq. So I first thing I came, I registered myself back in school to finish my school, my education in here, mm-hmm. and that's when. Um, I met my second husband, who is a wonderful guy. Um, he always like, please distinguish to the audience the first <laughs> husband from the second husband. You know, I was like, fine. You very much did, just so <laughs> there is no confusion about what a wonderful human being Amshan he, is. He is a very good human indeed. And um, and that's when we, that's what I learned, you know, uh, about the war in Bosnia. And I was back in school learning about the Holocaust, learning never again for the first time in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, but that same month I was learning about the Holocaust. I, there were also um, the front pages of uh, newspapers and magazines about concentration camps and rape camps that are taking place in Bosnia. And it was a very innocent way of um, um not innocent. I still like very logical. Naive. Uh, logical. Yeah, more like, logical. You know, yeah, like they said never again, but it's happening again. Thus, we must do something about it. Right. Um, I still believe that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I never thought I never thought that never again only applied to uh, one population. For me, never again is to all humans, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And I was like, okay, so we must do something. Mm-hmm. And, you know, started with... You know, I mean, I came from a country where we're afraid of our shadows. So I'm here like now in D.C. and like I was, you know, joining demonstrations to yeah. for, support the Bosnians. I was so excited. Like, whoa, I could speak. Your no one was back. You me. got your voice back. Yeah. And but eventually I was like, these demonstrations are just us shouting and we're not right. helping the people out there. We need to do something tangible. And so. I called different groups. It's like, what are you doing? I want to do something tangible for the groups for women in Bosnia. And long story short, you know, I was finally connected to the Unitarian Church, who was also doing this, asking the Hmm. same thing. And I came up with an idea to sponsor women in Bosnia. I didn't have money. I was a student. I was newly employed. Um, So I came up with the idea for each woman to uh, support one woman at a time by sending her $30 a month and exchange letters and pictures with her. And Was that while you were still in Washington before you even went to Bosnia? Did you have that idea? Yeah, the idea was definitely before that. It evolved and became more than that and became much wider than that. But the idea started in in Mm -hmm. Washington. And uh, the church gave me another gift. You know, it's like uh, they said, we'll support you for a year. Um, And I'm a Muslim, right? Like I had no connection to the church. They said, we'll support you for a year to get on your feet. This is a good idea. And after that, you're on your own. And Hmm. that was the deal. So I went uh, with Amjad to uh, Croatia at the time, uh, learned a lot from the women. I mean, the whole process, that first trip, I remember saying, we're here to help all raped women. And one of the raped (laughs) women, she said, no, you're not. I was like, what? And she says, you're not going to create an organization for only raped women. You're stigmatized us this way. Oh, you, you all specifically, women. you were originally, right. it was just about women right. who had experienced rape. And Interesting. She, exactly. And she said, it's for all women. So we are not mm. different from anybody else. Otherwise, you're hurting us. And it was, you know, yeah. the or- I led the organization for 20 years and it was constantly a learning process. You go to another country and another culture thinking this way and you yes. out of it learning another way and it's it never constantly. fails um and so that's why i want to say the idea started before in dc but 
the evolution of it. Now we also teach women women's rights. We also teach women about um, vocational skills and money mm-hmm. management. And the goal became about to enable them and help support them, you know, th- you know, survive for one year, but then even get jobs and stand on their feet and rebuild their lives uh, um, within their graduation after a one year of the program. And I recently went to Boston to celebrate the 30th oh. anniversary. Oh, yeah. This, um, so I ready this year you did? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yes. It was beautiful, oh, and I gosh. met some of the first women that oh, I worked with, and really? that we helped. And it was so such a heart filling, heartwarming experience. That was truly, oh, truly such a full circle moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, it really that I find that so fascinating that you came up with that idea before you had even visited Bosnia or Croatia, um, because I mean I was. After I read your book, I was so curious, and then I joined Women for M- Women International, sponsored women. I think it's a one-year commitment, so I think I did two or three. It's, I've kind of lost my memory of it, but that to me as a, a donor of just $30 a month, was that meant a lot, but to, to have that those letters, to actually get – I remember the first time I got a letter – Oh. I, I, oh, oh, she's real, you know, it's handwriting. Oh. It was absolutely, oh. and the truth of it and her honesty and her gratitude, and it was so meaningful. And I just think that, like you said, it evolved, which it did. But the fact that you came up with that, be- understood the importance of the human connection before you even met the first woman. I mean, it just speaks to a couple of things, the, the depth of your own humanity, mm. but also how you, were like healing yourself from the from the the own rape from your husband and the own sexual abuse and the own lack of power in Iraq and all those things. I mean, you were seems to me. I mean, I, I'm I'm maybe overreaching to say that that's what was your inspiration, but unconscious inspiration. I didn't so, yeah. I didn't know that that's what I was doing actually yeah. for the longest time and. To, um, because uh, it was not only it was like uh, I was um, uh, driven by uh, the, such energy that someone asked me how what keeps you going I mean you're reaching you're seeing the wretched of earth basically you're seeing what's the worst acts of humanity and I was yeah. like I am so pissed off at injustice that's what's mm-hmm. keeping me going mm-hmm. and so it was an expression of my all my anger at injustices mm-hmm. basically I wasn't conscious that I I'm too a product of war and I am too a product of violence. I was completely not conscious. Maybe the first time I was conscious about is my mother calling me, realizing I was doing this because I kept it a secret from my family Um, and called me in Sarajevo when the city was besieged and was screaming at me. And she's like, I risk my life getting you out of Iraq for Mm. you to go back to a war yourself. And I was like, what is she talking about? Like, you know, like, <laughs> and it was my first time to realize, oh, I also grew up oh. in war and I'm coming back to war, to the familiar. Um, and, mm. you know, and really the consciousness, the complete consciousness about my psychological connection to what I was doing did not come until I wrote my memoir. And that happened because I was talking with a Congolese woman Um in Congo, who was telling me about her story and how she was raped and her daughters were raped and her son was... Oh, that upgraded. story was unbelievable. I don't know how you even wrote it. It was so hard to read. Um, you know, I'm, yeah. I I love that woman very, very much. And at one point she told me, I, I, this, I, I haven't told anybody but you that story. This is a secret. So I looked at her and I was like, I'm a storyteller. You know, the way it works, I listen to your story. I come to America, I repeat the story. I raise awareness and I raise money from your story, but that money is not going to go to you. It's going to go to hundreds of women or thousands yeah, of women right. and partially you, but not, you know, not yeah. in equal proportion to all of them. And, you know, should I keep this a secret? And she looked at me and she said, if I can tell the whole world, um, what happened to me, um, I would. So other women would not go through what I've gone through. So other women would be spared. 
but I can't. You can. You go mm. ahead and tell the story. She gave you and permission. And that. Uh, that was a, not only a permission, that was, a, for me, a, a huge light bulb in my own um, consciousness that I am hiding behind this woman. That, uh, you know, I had no idea that I just made, I just like stopped telling my story. I did not tell about my story to anybody. I'm making it all about their story. I'm urging them to break their silence. I'm urging them to stand up. I'm urging them to speak truth to power. But I was not doing that. I was hiding behind them and not willing to share my story, not willing to tell my truth, not willing to and keep on dismissing it. And, and just this is after even a full, what, 10 years running women for years. women? Yeah, no, 15, 15 years. years. Yes, yeah. Um, and, and just dismissing it. And at one point, I realized that this is, okay, this is it. Either I do what I'm asking them to do or frankly resign really? and, and walk out because I don't have the courage that I'm asking them. Uh, I'm asking of them. And it was my biggest leap of faith um, to write my memoir, to tell my truth, to not hide and came to the conclusion that the only way I can continue this work is if I am doing exactly what I'm asking every single woman to do. And that has become my motto in life, um, yeah. uh, that I, you cannot ask others to do things that you are not willing to do. And that if we are really reflecting on ourselves, you will notice that we often ask others to do things that we are not willing to do, you know, mm. or that it's much harder for us to do or that we have yeah. not been in the discipline for us to do, um, but we expect it of others. So it's it's a humbling experience. It's a necessary experience. I think it's a uniting experience that led me to freedom, my own freedom. My breaking the truth led me to my own freedom. What was it specifically if, I mean, it wasn't one thing, but what were the things that you were ashamed to share or to look at? Was it Every, was it you're also involving your father's working for Saddam? Were you hiding that part well, as well? All of that. All of that. Um, at that time, I've seen myself as a feminist. I was very embarrassed to admit that I was in an abused marriage, um, mm. in an arranged marriage, because it had mm. nothing to do with feminism or with power mm. or strength or freedom. Um, I was very embarrassed of that. I was very scared of telling the uh, the truth about our relationship with Saddam. Uh, scared because that was a family secret and the code was not to share that story. Oh, I didn't uh, know it was a family secret. It wasn't uh, it obvious to No, it least... was it was public knowledge in my country, but, uh, uh, but the details of the relationship was a family secret. We never okay. spoke about it. You know, there mm. were we were I you know in the pictures of the front page in the newspapers in Iraq, but that's just pictures. No one knew the details. Um, and the book reveals all the details, everything. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, so I was scared. I was scared to, to break that silence. I was scared. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I was scared of people killing my family and killing me. I was scared of uh, everything. Well, I wondered and, about uh, that because your father, I, was your mother had passed by then? My mom right? had already died. But your yeah. father was still living in Iraq and still yeah. working. So. Yeah having lost everything, which is a whole nother yeah. story, but yeah. were you, you were, I, I, you mentioned that in, um, in freedom is an inside job that your father, you were worried for his safety. How did you balance that? Like whether, or your brothers are there as well. So how did you balance that you need to tell the truth and their need to be safe? Well, it was really a simple option or either we tell our truth or have history tell it for us. And history, people were like already saying, oh, they are Saddam's friends. They did this and this. They got. And oh. we, it, that was not true. Like, you know, we did yes, not benefit I from see. that relationship. We did not yeah. harm people. We were like barely surviving ourselves, right? Yeah. Um, so it was more like, if you're not going to tell the truth, we're going to be damned. At least let me tell the truth. And we may still be damned, but at least in truth. You know, yes. did um, he know you were writing it then, or oh, did they I know? Had, no, I had to have his blessing for sure. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. No, okay, no, no. Yeah. all of their blessings. Oh, well, that makes a big difference. Yeah, then, yeah. with with hesitation and trepidation, yeah. but yeah. you know, blessings nevertheless. Mm. Um, and they knew. Um, 
Um, and what ended up being, honestly, many people in Iraq called him and saying, good for her for writing the book. She did not only yeah. write her story, she wrote all our stories. Yes, I would be stopped in the street and people thank me for writing it, saying mm. you wrote all our stories. And, you know, eventually I came to realize all the things that I feared of, you know, um, did not come true. And mm -hmm. I came to the conclusion that, oh, um, I was the prison guard to my fear. I had at one point become the prison guard to my fear. I fed mm. my fear. I kept it locked. I kept it uh, alive. Um, and, you know, yes, the fear initially started from Saddam Hussein, but eventually I owned it. You know, mm. I, you know, we own our fear and only mm. I could break away from it. And so uh, now the way it impacted me is in few things. In my commitment to truth, um, uh, right now is I always I, I'm I'm always in commitment to living my truth, telling my truth, speaking my truth, being my truth, um, and in in the understanding that when I speak the truth, I have my liberation and peace of mind, and that freedom that the truth brings is so delicious so mm. delicious that it mm. is worth the struggle and the pain to get uh, to to process it uh, to get to the point of that freedom well it changed your relationship with the women you were working with then too didn't it when the book came out yeah absolutely i became then not someone who is helping them i became one of them oh my gosh uh, i am one of them hugely and, uh, important <laughs> yeah 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 and what about, and with coworkers as well, I imagine. I mean, everyone is hearing your story for the first time. Everyone, including yeah. my, my, at that time, my family in law, you know, everyone, my mother in law, my father in law, only my husband at the time knew, and uh, no one knew about it. And everyone, it came to the whole world all at one time. Um, Goodness. Yeah. You know, you're talking about the truth, you're speaking about it. It's, it's bigger than, I, I really want to encourage people to read both of your books because I don't know if I've ever, I have read books where I'm shocked at the truth um, that people are sharing. Like I'm, I'm shocked by the veracity The there's one woman, uh, there's a book and I, I wasn't thinking of this until just now, but did you read the book about the Yazidi woman who worked with uh, um, to tell her story? It's called the last Nadia. girl. The I last know Nadia. Girl. I know her personally. You know I was her. Like the first person to interview her, like weeks after she escaped from ISIS. Yeah. Oh my goodness! I was going to say that's that's amazing that you know her. That's the only other book that I've read where I I just am holding on to it that someone is that brave to tell that truth. Yeah. That openly. When I when it's met so difficult. Her, when I met, I mean, when I met her. She had just escaped from ISIS weeks and oh. she was still in a very improvised situation and a very humble and a very scary situation. I mean, her family. How did you even meet her? Because she hadn't, there'd I, been no book or anything. No, I was, I did my, I was doing my journal, my show in the Arab world. Um, okay. And it was literally the first time the story breaks out. And, and I remember because of safety issue for her safety and her family safety, we had to, take her somewhere else to do the interview. Um, and in the car, I turned to her and I said, are you sure? Are you sure you want to speak? Because this is dangerous. Yeah. And I remember her um, responding. She says, my, uh, the Miri, my consciousness does not allow me to stay silent. I must speak. Uh, my consciousness does not allow me to stay. Unbelievable. The now, how of her. beautiful of that, you know, that, that you know, it's a, uh, she's a beautiful, beautiful human being. Who has endured the worst kind of hell, the worst kind of hell that most people are afraid to read that book. I've tried to encourage people to read that as well. And it's just like, no, that's, and I think if we can't go there, if we don't, it just, it's such a disservice to people not to read their story when they have had the courage to tell it, when that courage took everything, including their safety. It's like we have the obligation to, to read it, to let that in, or we're never going to grow ourselves. And I, I would just say that 
I feel so much the same way. I did not think your second book, Freedom is an Inside Job, I did not think that could touch me the same way that your first book did. And it and it went even further. The, mm-hmm. Your truth about, the, I feel like we've had a lot of parallels that are nothing to the drama that yours has been. But when you talked about your marriage um, with Amjad and, and the 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 truth of that, of what you experience and how you even remember all your feelings and all your experiences is another whole mystery to me, but it's like, Oh my gosh, you are truthful about everything, you know? And then you, and then you take it to another step of your, your shortcomings and how, even though you're a progressive woman and a feminist that you had this arrogance about you that you had to look at, you had to look at your own shadows, even in the good that you were doing looking at people who are doing terrible things and trying to understand them. That was, I, I think I, I wrote this, that it w- that was a seminal work. That work um, in Freedom is an Inside Job of what, and I'd like you to talk about it as much, and it's difficult to summarize it, <clears throat> excuse me, because you wrote a whole book about it, but how we have to look at our own shadows and our own judgments and our own landscape, interior landscape, in order to solve world problems, in order to solve the divides in our country and between Shia and Sunni, between Christian and, you know, all the, all the divides in the world that we, why go there until we've gone here? You won't get anywhere until you've gone here. Can you describe that as, (laughs) I know it's like I said, it's a whole book about it, but. No, I mean, it's, you know, it really came out of um, my desire to be in alignment uh, between my, between, I, I'm, I'm using myself, but obviously it applies for everyone, between my values, my vision, or an image of myself, and my actions. Okay. And I think these things are really separated for a lot of us. A lot of us think that we are only good. And the world is as, and I was that. The world is good and bad, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind and stingy, uh, mean and yeah. uh, like generous and stingy, whatever. Like you know, um, black and white, uh, black and white uh, division. And and I, I was that. I really mm-hmm. was right. Mm-hmm. And then I realized it's, you know, and there were moments in my life that caught me, saying, "Oh my God." I am becoming what I'm fighting against. Uh, and the in concept for just to give you an example, um, yeah. I'm a women's rights activist. I fight for women's rights and not for women not to be stereotyped or cornered into one image, one thing, whatever. And I was in Afghanistan in a refugee camp, and I see this. Taliban looking man walking towards me and I'm mm. scared. I was like, they are Taliban. They're going to be killing us. I hate them. Da, 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 all of these mm-hmm. things. And, and I had to stay still because if I had, if I ran away, the woman I was just speaking with would be in danger. So mm. I stand still and they come and walk towards me and they spread their arms and give me their hands to shake it. And I was like, what? And then they say, the first thing they say, we we're here to thank you for making our wives smile. We haven't seen them happy uh, for the longest time until you arrived. And they were not the Taliban. They, they're apparent, you know, Afghan men dress the same way, you know, it's a, they're, their attire, basically it's their traditional attire. Mm-hmm. And they were not the Taliban and they were, pro- you know, these wonderful husbands who really wanted yeah. to thank this woman who was making their wives happy. And in that moment, I realized, oh, my God, oh, my God, I am uh, stereotyping all men as one thing as much as I am fighting against the stereotyping of women as all one thing. And every time, I mean, you do that, Republican, Democrats, women, men, genders, whatever, everything, everything, and you think that you are like for this, but you are really in the process doing this onto others, right? Yeah, yeah. And... It's really when I caught myself in that uh, untruth, unalignment, I uh, realized that this is dangerous. And I, in this particular case, I embarked upon talking with men and trying to understand them and, you know, coming to the conclusion that the good, the bad and the ugly is in all women and it's in all men and it's all genders, right? Uh, any, that, is, that is just, um, I just gave you a chapter of the book, not the old book, but the, but the point of it. 
And it's is in alignment of ourselves. Is how can we live our life from and how can we be activists and people who are committed to changing the world from the length of our spine mm-hmm. rather than the depth of our than the, the width of our chest because shouting how I started my activism shouting uh, got me places I do not deny but I was not always in alignment with my values, you know? Um, and to work to be in alignment with my values is really hard, sometimes really yes. expensive. Sometimes it's isolating and feels lonely. Mm-hmm. And all of the times it made me more compassionate and more patient person towards the others uh, because I realized how hard it is to be truly in alignment. Um, and mm-hmm. so that book is asking if we each are truly in alignment in our values and look the journey inward rather than just pointing the fingers at the people outside of us, we actually would become more compassionate and more patient and, and curious about the, the depth of the others and where they're coming from and acknowledging their pains and their fear and finding a way, finding a, th- a third way to, to have the conversation. It's such a tall order. Like I think about when I was a diversity trainer in the 1990s and I, and I think about, well, anyone who was against racism or, or anyone who was racist would have been my enemy. I'm teaching a very multicultural experience. And so to me that, and I never looked at that. I never looked at a, a racist or a person who was opposed to, even people were very much opposed to diversity training and I would look at them as the enemy. And it's, it's just so interesting. It's such a simple example, but it's every single thing we're doing that we think we're doing for good, as long as we're othering those who don't do the same thing, that's, we're getting nowhere. We're, we're making little progress. And, you know, it's the same applies for Earth, for example. We're all saying we're committed to climate change. We are all like, you know, oh, of, I mean, this is we're talking about the group of people who says, oh, my God, we have to do something good by Earth. We are climate change. Exactly. Blah, blah, blah. But, but, news, <laughs> but not even that. I mean, look at the personal behavior of how many friends I have who still are wastes oriented to up to their you know mm-hmm. heads. yes plastic yes. bottles of water yes uh, uh, over consumerism throwing things without recycle these mm-hmm. are basic these are uh, friends who are who perceive themselves as liberals open-minded yes. pro-climate change uh, exact experiences all of these this. but then they are a hundred percent acting in an opposite behavior. That's yes. what I call consistency because yes. to be consistent. And when I bring it up, they say, Oh, but that's not cool. Or it's not, uh, well, I know whatever. Oh, it's inconvenient to be consistent is not comfortable. That's the thing. It is right. not easy, but we've got to do it to be in alignment with our values because when we are not aligned in our values, we are corrupting ourselves, basically, when we are not in alignment right. with our and values. We have to be doing it when no one's watching. I'll do this sometimes with a, like a yogurt container, and I, I have to remove the paper, and put this goes here and that goes there, and I'm alone, and nobody's looking, and I don't want to do it. And every time I have this argument with myself, it's like, do it when no one's watching. Do it. Don't ever, don't do it. <laughs> right. Never don't do right. it. So um, perfect segue into the last uh, c- part of the conversation, which is Women for Earth. And honestly, I love that name. I think that y- it may not God have been your first choice. Yeah. Oh, my God. I can't believe I did that. <laughs> yeah. I missed that name. Right. Okay. It's all right. The Daughters for Earth, I think it's maybe more powerful because it is, that is what we're here for. We, yeah. At this time, we are here at this time for a reason. And to be for the earth has to become all of our purpose, yeah. whether it's our natural one or not. And so can, can you talk about how you came into this? Your, your, your partners, your co-founders are remarkable women. Uh, how did this, maybe if you'd like to maybe intro, just introduce them or I can, but I just want to describe kind of how that came into your life or if you approach them. No, they. I was approached on how we can mobilize women uh, to be a part of climate solutions and to be energized in the conversation. And I had no idea about climate. I was not uh, 
Oh, really? I really, yeah. I did not know. This is not my issue. Like, I did not yeah. understand it even. focus on so and, many things, yeah. And, I, um, and it took me years to really read and understand and call and meet and to come to the conclusion that, uh, oh, my God, women are really excluded from the table on, on climate change. So and that wasn't just no a year ago. That was, it's, this started no, quite a long this started time ago. About, about, you know, four years ago where I was okay. asked, can you, what can we do for climate? And I was like, oh, let me check. And, you know, <laughs> what check. I came to realize, you know, is that, uh, you know, women are upset, actually, if anything. It's like no one is speaking with us. No one is addressing us. No one is mobilizing us. No one is funding us. No one is. Uh, and so it was a huge gap in the discussion, not mm -hmm. a small gap. And I am not a scientist. I'm not a climate expert, but I am a women's rights expert. And I am someone who is committed to justice around the world, you know. And so. When I came, it's like, this is a big story, not a small story. Women get impacted. They do a lot of work to protect, preserve the earth, shift to regenerative agriculture, shift mm. to renewable energy. They're getting no support, no funding, and no voice at the table. Let's shift that. And I must say, within one year of launching exactly, uh, I would say to date, uh, to this month, Daughters for Earth, we have funded uh, one more... Um, you know, we have disturbed uh, more than $1.2 million to 50 women-led efforts, mobilize amazing women from all over the world, about to launch a, a fantastic campaign that I urge everyone to check us out in two months, daughtersforearth.com and that org, I mean, org, yeah. and, um, and really, uh, you know, created a coalition of women from all over the world. I, just before this call, I was in a call with women in Kenya and Switzerland as they are marching for Mother Earth and we're mobilizing women from all over the world on how we can coordinate our activities together and our work together and support each other. So our commitment is that we've got each other's back uh, yeah. because the work uh, is so important and we, again, are marginalized and we've got to push forward and commit to each other uh, moving forward. I, I think you just named it in a couple of different ways, talking about that it is the collaboration that matters. And this yeah. is what women are so good at. You know, Paul Hawken, who's, I'm sure you're, you know, a huge yeah. uh, climate activist for many decades. And he talks so often about not using the word about don't use fighting for this. Or, you know, he says the words that we use really matter. And, you know, we don't want to fight climate change. We don't want to go to, the, everything is about a, a, a wording of war yeah women don't have that wording women are, are are more let's how can we do this together and not have a competition about who comes up with the conclusion first or you know there is this um it, it gave me some hope that i haven't um i just want to pet your little cat <laughs> <laughs> what's what's his or her name uh, eli her name is eli, oh, eli. Um, oh, but I like mean, <laughs> she is a very loving cat yeah. yeah but i mean back to my co-leaders because everything yes. we're doing with daughters is about co-leadership so yeah we you know i have uh, justin winter who's an environmental expert uh from one earth uh, we have uh rachel rivera who is a philanthropic uh, expert. We have uh, indigenous women who are and women from all over the world leading our philanthropy, um, giving. I mean, everything we're doing, everything is in collaboration. I have zero interest in doing anything alone at the moment. Yeah. It's not worth yeah. it. It's too. Uh, I'm too old to do that, you know, and it's so well, much it's not better. Effective. It's not it effective is, to yes. do it alone. You yes, know? exactly. And, um, yeah. Well, I, yes, I, I will of course put all the links on the, on the show notes, Please. but, uh, but definitely I encourage people to go look at just the, the strength of the women that are involved in this project is just massive. And the funding that you have access to and have raised is massive. So um, I this is the most hope I've had in a long time to see a new organization. And it's only a year oh. old. So oh, it's, watch uh, with, wait and you see what's even, coming. You haven't even it's started. So and, it's so exciting. It's so exciting. Let's check us out in May. It's so exciting. And really, it's an open invitation for everyone, not only to be part of the solution, but giving the science in a simple way, showing everyone, like explaining the things that gibberish we're hearing about in a simple, logical English, way and giving yes. the tools to everyone to be a part of the solution and giving the roadmap for everyone to be part of supporting each other. Like that is our simple goal. And it's very exciting. 
Well, I mean, all the all the best to you in all these endeavors. I am I am in your corner, one hundred percent. I'm in the corner. Fabulous. So even though I keep saying the name wrong, I'm one hundred percent in the okay. corner. I'm gonna get. I'm getting involved in this immediately. I'm thrilled about this. So. Fantastic, daughters for Earth, uh, Zainab. It has been my greatest pleasure. I can't yeah. thank you enough, and um, I just look forward to what you're doing next. And thank you. And I and I'm gonna. Be right thank behind you. you, seeing what you're doing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you the so pleasure much. It was all mine. I really appreciate it. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks all. So. Right. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.